good afternoon everybody and welcome to another sofa safari from myself trevor and showing my tracker today and the rest of the team we hope you've all had a great week and have been looking forward to this afternoon we've started a little bit earlier and as you can see there's some lovely light around so we're going to make the most of it um, just a few things again to remember when we cross over with uh, ryan and uh, brad and tom just remember just to be patient either reconnect there's a slight delay and then you'll be back live with us but before we get going we, we're quite close to the river this afternoon it's such a lovely time of the year to be along the sand river with us being in the winter now it's such a wonderful way to start um stewie's going to take us through a few uh, track quizzes for you guys again we brought that back last week we didn't quite get to it because we were running after that cheetah for you but uh, we found some nice tracks along here uh, put your answers up ask questions and let's go have a little bit of fun so i'm going to hand you over to stewie he's going to do some tracking with us and see if we can get the answers right perfect come for a little walk and we'll see what we can find here uh, proved to be quite a hit last uh, time we did it so um, yeah excited to keep it going and don't forget uh, as many questions as you like throughout the, the uh, show and then uh, we'll come back to you with some of the answers so uh, the same format applies we'll do three questions um, keep coming with me Brad and uh, try and figure out what they are um, and then toward the end we'll uh, we'll give you some of the answers okay it was a very nice track that I circled just uh, a few seconds ago, right here in front of us. So uh, have a look at that and see what you make of it. There's, there's a few more that might give you some clues, uh, but we're talking about this particular track in here. And then uh, I'll give you a little clue on this one. There's a nice angled shape to it with that line down the middle. And then there's also another line almost parallel there. And just to give you an idea of the, the width here. It's only about the, the width of my little finger. So that's the first one there. And we'll come back to that one at the end. Another one down here as well. So this one's a little bit bigger, but as you can see, a similar kind of shape, but just much bigger. So you've got this ridge line down the middle here and then coming to two points here. But this one, if I put my hand down, we're, we're talking well over 12, 15 centimeters here. So to give you a bit of scale, that's a, a much longer track there. Okay. And then moseying on down the road, beautiful light. The low sunlight here gives us a really good definition in the tracks. So um, perfect time to be out and about on your on your trail and, and looking at tracks and uh, keep coming down the road good angle there from brad quite a busy little section here so a lot of activity many many tracks and then i i noticed a couple here just crossing the road so there's there's a track there and then there's uh, a track here and then it comes across onto this side of the road here okay so again, uh, similar shape to what we've just seen, but it's all about the scale of it. So, so there's my hand, and it's probably uh, maybe half the size of the previous track. So we've got three different scales to the track in terms of size, and then uh, a few clues as to um, some of the markings in them as well. You can see this perfect little shape here coming to a point here and coming to a point here, but... Uh, probably only about 10 centimeters on this one all right so three questions for you some might be easy some might be a little bit trickier but uh, try and work through them and then uh, at the end of the show we'll come back and and uh, see what your answers are and some of you may have got them right
better. So Stewie, what's so important about the bush, you've really got to know your droppings. Yeah. But what's important often when we're tracking and we're analysing one the track but also fresh droppings, especially with elephants, you know, how do we know whether they're fresh or whether they, they're old? And we're gonna do it the traditional way. So um, and when you come and visit us, we always encourage you to do this because this is just grass and leaves. So first of all, is the dropping warm or is it cold? Um, in this case it's a little bit cold so maybe from midday but now there's also a, a very interesting thing about telling the difference between males and females you know first of all you've got to put your finger in it how warm is it in there and then you hang on sweet must be a female sure I think she's going that way what do you think okay well let's you go you want to just confirm the taste no? so right in there you say yeah yeah, yeah right yeah, into yeah, the middle proper, right? huh? okay and if and it's then... sweet it's a female I get a bit of the sweetness just uh, on, on, mm. the, on the palate, yeah. like a bit of an after, okay, and a little bit warmer as you get right yeah, in there. Yeah, so maybe an hour or two old. Okay. See what I mean? You really got to know your droppings. Okay. Well, let's let's go find them. Go find them, eh? In this way well the river is not far from here Stewie, and okay. it's been a beautiful day let's head down to the river so i was talking about the river we've been very fortunate that um, through our properties one of the perennial rivers the sand river and like i was mentioning this time of the year as you can see such beautiful lights about generally pans and that dry up and the animals generally do congregate around the river late afternoon um, we're hopefully going to try Bumble along the river a little bit and see what we can find. Hopefully, some female elephants. <laughs> <laughs> it's a test of your skills. Yes. <laughs> also, some buffalo droppings there, Stu. Tracks here. Yeah. Cool. Tracks of the alleys. Have a look along here. Such a beautiful sight driving along the river in the afternoons. along the river perhaps you'll also hear some of the lovely sounds coming from the river seems like a group of buffalo down there lying up in the reeds small small herd there by the looks of things and your cape buffalo often during the day will come to the greener parts of the river where there's more water for some grazing some water and often they'll lie up and because they're ruminants end up uh, chewing the cud um, good chance that they'll lie up here for most of the evening and possibly move um, during the day hearing the, the sounds of the river all the insect life it's abundant down at the river winter times fairly dry and a lot of the insect activity um, lessens but uh, you can always guarantee the back, background sounds of the insects along the river so he's probably pushed uh, through to where uh, you're all viewing now through to the sort of the northwest. We might see if we can go around and Let's catch up with him that side.
buck tracks. Elephant tracks seem to head in that direction there, Stu, so yeah, let's go through there. Established trees. Obviously, they can get their uh, root systems right down to tap into the water on the, on the riverbed. So, very many well established trees here with the jackalberry tree or the, the uh, African ebony tree. And then, uh, there's a lot of leadwood trees along this section, apple leaf trees. Just coming up ahead of us is probably uh, one of the oldest and largest uh, specimens of the leadwood tree. It's so named because it's extremely dense wood, so very heavy and uh, in fact uh, unable to float if you were to try to uh, fashion it out into a, a coral or a dugout canoe or something like that, would, the, the wood would actually sink. But very slow burning. Uh, You'll often find this particular tree on fire for days and weeks after uh, if a bushfire happened to come through the area and it makes very good coals as well. And often what the, the, local, the local communities or local before uh, Colgate or any of the toothpaste mm -hmm. came out, if you, once the fire is burnt out you can take the ash with a bit of water and you can actually use it as a toothpaste. Um, I've never tried it, but uh, if you look at um, all our lovely local staff, they've all got very bright, white, strong teeth. So I'm presuming <laughs> it, it has some good, is, good effect. I presume it's probably because uh, it's such uh, slow burning wood that the coal actually burns down to a very, very fine consistency. So it's not a, a very quick burn that leaves quite rough charcoal. It's very fine uh, substance. So yeah, probably a bit more uh, palatable as well. a little bit the river's dropped a bit in the last few weeks our rainy season's only really in the summer months um, 
can see it's dropped quite a lot now. A lot of activity here, a lot of tracks and signs. So they've definitely been filling around the riverbed at midday. Sycamore fig that uh, Stewie referred to earlier. They estimate this tree to be over 200 years old, quite significant landmark in this area. That, uh, local tribes used to leave letters or messages here um, to come and read and then pass a message on to your, your local community. It's nicknamed the Postman's Tree. Brad can zoom in there for us and get a nice bird perched up at the top there's a white backed vulture. Often seen late afternoon vultures catching the last rays of the sun, often on dead trees. We're quite fortunate along the river here. There's a few white back um, vulture nests. Um, and as we know their ability to soar in the thermal is very, very high. Phenomenal eyesight to search for carcasses and that on the ground. And one of the main reasons I've been asked many times, why doesn't the vulture have feathers on his head and, and one of the main reasons is that when they're feeding obviously it's old carcasses that may already have parasites in it and when they put their heads into the carcasses to to clean up all the leftovers they don't get a lot of the parasites it would be very difficult to preen the feathers on your head when you can't reach it so that's one of the main reasons for it like beautiful big birds and there's something very special about watching a vulture catching a thermal so incredible to watch it because they never you never see them flapping their wings the way they catch it they've got very interesting wings it's called an alula but like a flap on an aeroplane and they can control as they pick up the the air movements you don't see them often flapping they use this alula also known as a bastard wing and they literally like an aeroplane would tilt its flaps to control the way it's going same as a vulture when we see them catching thermal so very high up Antelope. Lovely afternoon sun and then they always look so pretty, always in groups. And there's a good chance now that the rutting season is, is completed. However, we're still hearing the, the odd few males having their, their testosterone rutting arguments. But these females now, the adult females are possibly pregnant. And then after the rain, sort of November, December, is their gestation and they'll give birth to their lambs in numbers. There comes the ram there toward the back now. Yeah. Perhaps still uh, moving around in the herd in case there's one or two females that um, got skipped on the first round. And he'll be able to cover them and sometimes that's why we see a, a, a late lambing uh, season with a few latecomers after those initial first rains. <laughs>
something new and exciting we're going when you're feeling from this side Stu? i think it's fine off yeah okay there were some tracks there but it didn't seem like a, a lot maybe some of the younger bulls sure. possibly the herd is still in this side earlier that's the sausage tree it develops these large fruits uh, it will uh, hang down like uh, almost like a salami outside of an Italian butcher referred to the sausage tree because of those fruits uh, fruit shapes not this time of the year though a very diet so um, the phragmites read that they're feeding on give them a bit of nutrition and then uh, later on they'll probably move up out of the riverbed they've had a drink now and quench their thirst and then uh, probably follow the rest of that herd that's moved up into the thicker bush and carry on feeding on some other uh, select species of uh, vegetation there also seasonal that's the thing mm. like Stu was saying you know in the summer months might get nice lush green grass and fruits and leaves um, but this time of the year along the river that's where you know the greenery is so it's important that they stick to where the nutritious food is such a big body like that you need to eat about 180 kilograms of food a day so they have to work really hard um, to nourish themselves and again you know this time of the year with the uh, coming into winter they'll focus perhaps more on the bark using their tusks to scrape and pull the bark off trees to feed on the cambium layer where there's a lot more protein and that will help maintain their bulk. This is a slightly easier food to, to select here. I just pluck it out of the sand and straight into the mouth. No, no uh, peeling off of anything. No, no digging and scraping with the tusk. No 
uh, digging either, so it's a, it's a very easy meal, quick meal for them. I don't know if you can pick up on this as well. This is what we're looking at here, right? Maybe you can zoom in. It's actually quite sharp and pointy and quite spiky. And then the, the edge of each leaf blade is actually fairly sharp. So this can actually cut you as well. So, um, you know, they've developed such uh, uh, hardened um, lips and the, the tongue is quite rough. So that can handle something, something like this. I mean, if it can handle an acacia tree and the thorns that come off the acacia trees, some of those white dried thorns this long, then uh, the Phragmites reed here is really nothing for them. But uh, believe you me, when this can, this can easily get stuck, stuck in our, our skin, it can be quite a sharp, uh, sharp prick there. Are these two coming to uh, meet up with each other? It looks like they're going to greet each other. Let's see. The buffalo also seem to be on the move now. Such beautiful light this time of the day. Such a beautiful, peaceful scene. Ryan Ronkin. Interesting. Now the the buffalo are starting to look to to move as as. Uh, as Femi said, maybe having a, a drink as well, just beyond the elephants. And then uh, it'll be interesting to see which way they want to go and, uh, to come in and amongst these elephants. That could be quite interesting. Seems like they're just drinking over there. Yeah. While we still have a little bit of light, we'll head up, see if we can find the rest of the herd. And then we'll hand over to our other team shortly and uh, let's see what they've got up for us now um, to see how we're going to get out of here. <laughs> What's your idea here, Stewie? Back the way we came. <laughs> you make it sound so easy. Good afternoon everybody welcome to yet another sofa safari and as you can see Tom and I and Brandon <laughs> have uh, been joined or rather we've joined 
the Ottawa Pride with the Matimba male. He's resting up over there. And you can see we've got a couple of heads up, but everybody's still nice and fat and enjoying this late afternoon sun. I'm sure you guys can see now that Brandon has panned back onto them, but um, as, as Ryan's mentioned, you know, big, big, full bellies. And these lions killed a kudu about two days ago now that we can confirm. We, we actually found the remains whilst out trying to track them. Um, but we think in, in between that, so last night, we, we assume they have killed something else. There's still a few kind of uh, tainted um, blood marks on, on some of the, the jowls of these lions. Um, and of course those extra full bellies uh, just allude to the fact that they might have killed something else again um, So nice and nice and full, you know, very happy not to be going anywhere And that's uh, probably one of the things we see most frequently with lions and, and we always joke about it saying that uh, You know lazy lions and the lions are always sleeping uh, Which is the truth, you know, they do spend most of their time sleeping uh, But at the end of the day, it's one of the, the, the kind of um, factors that make them extremely successful um, it's, it's energy efficiency and as, as most of you guys will know um, that is one of the the most kind of prominent driving forces out here is, is that uh, attempt to be energy efficient in order to survive and thrive as well so very interesting to see um, but uh, yeah at least we had a, a few heads up there which was quite nice as the temperature starts dipping now we, we start to see the, that kind of happening you know a few heads popping up and it's, it's quite a slow transitional um, bit of activity where you know we'll slowly start seeing stretching yawning heads up you know just becoming a little bit more alert um, and then looking into the the evening the cooler evening to get moving again <laughs> You can see how <clears throat> in tune these lions are to other noises. We're talking, no problem, but one of the others rolls over and just sends a little rustle through the grass and everybody <laughs> has a quick look. Oh, there's a sneeze as well. But it just shows how often we'll be talking and, and uh, talking with our guests and the, and the animals, the lions and the leopards show no reaction and something in the distance that we can't hear, a uh, simple twig snapping or like we saw a rustle in the grass and all the heads shoot up and just showing how in tune they are and how good that sense of hearing is yeah and just to add to what ryan said there of course you know being in tune with your environment is is once again something that they need to in order to survive so by hearing that twig snap or that branch you know being brushed aside means that that could be food or it could be a potential enemy also so um, as most of you guys will know, predator competition is extremely intense in these regions. Um, we have multiple different prides out here, which is one of the, the most beautiful things or, or most intricate things about this, this region is uh, the lion dynamics. And being part of this, this open system, you know, the Greater Kruger Open System, means we see a lot of this, this dynamic, this very fluid kind of population moving in and out. Um, of course, as Ryan mentioned, these are the Ottawas. Um, and right here where we are sat at the moment, there's been sign of a, a single female moving in and out of the region. Um, and she belongs to a, a once very successful pride known as the Shimungwes. Um, and potentially a cub that's been in tow with that female. So we still haven't seen her. Some of our, our anti-poaching units that have been moving through the area have um, been lucky enough to see her and, and obviously inform us. Um, but it just shows how, you know, there's any, anything could happen. You know, there's, there's multiple different um, lion prides that, that could come into the region. Um, you could even have, you know, a new coalition of male lions coming in. It could be today, it could be tomorrow. Um, you never know. So that's the beauty of this open system is that we, we just never really know what might happen. Um, and as we're saying, that's why they need to be so alert, um, not only to, to look out for food, but also to um, be wary of, of competition or, or potential enemies. We think they could actually be on the lookout for that Shumungwe female. Yeah. Um, from tracks we had of last night, they have walked on top of her tracks uh, along with the cub. Uh, fortunately, whatever pulled them this way uh, got them off of her scent uh, and her trail. But as far as we're aware, it looks like they have followed her. And if anybody does know the history of our lines, they will know that this pride is part of the reason 
the fishermongers are in such trouble is uh, these lionesses themselves have been responsible for a few of the deaths. Now, often people don't think about that. When it comes to predators, often people will think, yes, lions versus hyenas, or, or hyenas versus leopards, and yes, leopards will kill hyenas, and, and vice versa, and lions, etc. But often when you say to people, lions kill lions, people get afraid and they, they get taken aback. But, but it does happen. Um, we spoke about it with the elephants last week, and, or the week before, and we said how with a herd of elephants like a pride of lionesses, females are related. With these females and the youngsters, they are all related. And that is the most important thing to them, family. And they will look after each other. And so a lioness from another pride is as seen as an enemy as a hyena or a leopard would be. And they will attack and go from there. And Potentially, that's why they could have been looking for her, but like we say, fingers crossed, her and her new little one have managed to get out of the area. There's a question, how would they fight off competition in this state? <laughs> um, very difficultly, but um, yes, w w once it gets turned on. I mean, for example, now, all these lions are fat and fast asleep, but if a food opportunity came along, if a buffalo, an injured buffalo or an injured giraffe came into the area, these lions would be up and going straight away. There would be no waiting. And the same with other lions. If other lions came in here, that adrenaline pumps very quickly and they go straight into action. That's why sometimes you'll see lions will kill something, uh, very often with uh, our larger prides, and kill numerous things within the same hunt. So that adrenaline keeps going and keeps them, keeps them hunting, even when they're fat. It's quite amazing with the, the size of the, the belly also. I mean, you can see, you can imagine how much, how much food is, is, you know, held within that belly. Um, big old tummies at the moment, but their, their ability to digest and break down that, um, that meat is, is also extremely intensive. So they might look extremely kind of encumbered now and, and uh, hefty and, and like they might not be able to move. But by tomorrow, if you see these lions again, that belly shrinks very quickly. So it's an extremely aggressive digestive system. Um, so just also a, a lovely, you know, lovely thing to see often even within the, the a, a kill site or a, a scene if you come across lions feeding on a buffalo or a, uh, a giraffe, whatever it might be, um, they, uh, they of course, you know, eat this huge amount, they, they gorge themselves, they can be covered in blood and, and all the rumen, so it can be quite, uh, quite shocking to witness. Um, but then again, you might see them the next day, perfectly groomed, you know, looking fairly nice and, and sleek again and, and uh, healthy. So, yeah, just all part of their, their ability to sustain themselves and, and uh, keep nice and uh, healthy. Two questions that are, I think we can line up together. How often do they kill and do they have a preferred dish? <laughs> um, so I'll answer one. Big and large. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Something big enough to feed all of them. <laughs> we don't, we, we yeah. usually helps quite nicely. Yeah. Um, obviously with a lot of mouths to feed, uh, a bigger prey would be preferred. Um, something like a buffalo or a giraffe. Uh, will last the pride a lot longer than something like a kudu or a wildebeest uh, that showed the other night. I mean, a, a big kudu bull lasted 24 hours. Uh, a big kudu bull can weigh 250, 280 kilos. That's almost 600 pounds, right? That's a lot of food. Um, where something like an impala, you look at a female impala, 50 kilos, 110 pounds, it's not going to go somewhere uh, far with a big group of lions. So with regards to what they, they'd like to eat, Yes, they would like something bigger just because it will feed them and sustain them for longer. Um, but that's also the thing with the predator is you, you can't be fussy. You can't turn down the food when it is there. That's why I said if the opportunity to hunt again, even though they have full bellies, they will. They kill something and they can kill something right away again, they will. And they'll do it again. I mean, I've seen a female leopard with three impala in the same tree. Okay. She was there for 10 days. But because the opportunity was there, she took it. Right. They're not like elephants that can walk around and food is available all the time. All right. So when the opportunity is there, they've got to take it and they can't be fussy. So yes, they'd prefer something big, but if something small comes along, they'll take that as well.
but um, in general I guess you could say an estimated average is uh, generally every kind of three to four days maybe once a week uh, but exactly what Ryan's saying is they're opportunistic animals and uh, you've got to take what you can get out here because you never know when your, your next meal might come about. Um, and although they are very successful predators, it's definitely not easy, you know, it's not free pickings that these animals can go out and, and take whatever they want. Um, each kind of prey item, each prey animal rather, is extremely um, efficient in, in living out here also. They've evolved side by side with these predators. So they know exactly how to uh, avoid them and, and you know they've, they've developed certain senses and uh, obviously defenses like horns and their incredible hearing and sight and smell, um, hooves, teeth. These animals will do anything to survive. So it's definitely not easy for a predator to take them down. Um, and we often see the very telling signs on the bodies of these lions or, or big leopards um, we see scarring we see you know old broken bones that have refused and um, lots of damage that that just tell the hardship that these lions go through not only the intercompetition with fighting and other predators but actually taking down um, animals you know I'm sure many of you guys have seen imagery of of lions with their teeth kicked out or you know certain uh, very shocking injuries um, and that that is because you know zebras zebra kick um, you know buffalo use their horns and and um, kind of trample these guys so it, it can be very challenging for them um, so definitely not a not an easy thing which goes hand in hand with that opportunism they have to take what they can get when they can get it yeah. I think I think that's one thing that we we're all used to being asked by our guests is why doesn't the lion just catch the impala exactly yeah. um, the lions have walked past the impala why didn't they catch that impala and, uh, I think people don't realize how well equipped these prey species are to get away from these guys. Yeah, exactly. um, uh, it's uh, one of the reasons why we see so many more prey species than we do with the predators is because it is far more difficult uh, to, to, to be a predator like these guys, uh, um, leopards, to, to live. You, you need to be a prime athlete. Yeah, pretty much. You've got to earn your place uh, out you've, here. Yeah. You've got to be the strongest, you've got to be the fittest, and you've got to be the smartest. And if you don't have all those things, unfortunately, you don't make it here. Yeah. And that's that's something quite nice to see now with this pride in specific is they, uh, they're bouncing back really nicely. Some of you might have heard in one of our early, early sofa safaris that um, these lions went through a, a bit of turmoil, you know, this, this pride specifically, um, almost relying entirely on one of their, their younger adult females. And uh, what we're seeing now is, is the, the sub-adult male here and the three youngsters um, who are just under two years old. The sub-adult is about two and a half. Um, we're starting to see them play more of a role within the pride. Um, and of course, that's a huge help to that one adult female who is kind of keeping them afloat. Um, so it's, it's again this resilience, this ability to bounce back and once these youngsters start uh, coming into their own and, and having all those uh, elements that Ryan mentioned, this will be an extremely successful pride once again. Um, and it's, it's amazing to have witnessed that transition. Again, beauty of the, uh, the Greater Kruger Open System. Maybe just point out the Matimba. Is he in good condition? Um, he as, 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 as good as he, he can be doing at the moment, yeah. He, he was up a little bit earlier. He, he has still got his obvious limps, but he has fed as well. Um, and you can see the big belly there. Uh, but yeah, no, not looking too bad. Yeah. De definitely seen him looking worse. Yeah, and he's, he's almost entirely uh, reliant on this, this pride though also. If he, when he's on his own, we see his, his condition immediately start to decline. Um, and as soon as he gets back into touch with the, the lionesses, with the, the kind of uh, main pride here, um, we see him obviously start to feed again and he bounces back very quickly. So when he's full, he's, uh, he's nice and healthy, but at the end of the day, he is still a, a very old animal. Um, so yeah, it's, uh, it's very interesting once again to see how it, how it changes. Everybody, so we're going 
gonna sign off with these guys. We're gonna let them enjoy the last little bit of the light, enjoy the last little bit of their nap. Um, as you can see, Tom and myself looking a little bit warm. All right, it is nice and cold today. We did enjoy the cold tracking this morning. But uh, yeah, enjoy your winter week. Have a great week, stay safe, uh, be good. And uh, we're gonna cross you guys back over to Trevia and then for some of your answers. Thank you guys, take it easy. Welcome back everybody, we really hope you enjoyed the lion sighting. We truly had a wonderful experience trying to find them over the last two days. You know, and this is where we, you know, we, we think about lockdown and how much we're missing our trackers who are at home looking after their families and um, you know, us trying to utilize our tracking skills. We've learned from them, um, I hope we did them proud. But we had a lot of fun finding them and I'm really glad you had a good sighting. And coming towards the end of the day, such a wonderful setting with a pod of hippos you may have got a glimpse of the hyena that came in for a drink but um, an African bush sunset um, like no other with an afternoon like this and you know the hippos this pod of hippos you'll have a dominant male here and as the sun sets and it gets cooler they'll actually leave the water and they'll feed on feed on grass throughout the night they're grazers and nocturnal grazers so during the day they stay in the water to hydrate themselves because their skin is very sensitive to the sun and then after nightfall they'll head out cover huge distances grazing um, and many people think they actually eat meat they don't they focus purely on grazing very similar diets to that of a, of a white rhinoceros but in these areas and obviously this time of the year is fantastic because often it's quite cool during the day and the hippos will actually come lie out down on the bank and if they're not too nervous of us we get to see them because when we see them like this we don't really get a true uh, understanding of their massive big size until you see a big hippo standing out uh, on the edge of the water and they can move incredibly quickly for a big bulky animal. I don't believe this water is too deep. So a very, uh, it's, it's uh, hard to believe how they can just disappear and only show their eyes and ears and part of their back but they're probably all lying on their bellies uh, down on the soft mud under the water there and when they really want to move out then you see them stand up and and move uh, showing themselves more in the water quite focused on us so obviously uh, we, we, we must be quite interesting to them on standing on the bank here Sun just about to hit the horizon there, so I don't know if we can see it, but there is a crocodile just swimming right underneath the sun right now. You can just see his Glistening wake, water yeah, there. the wake behind him with the water glistening there. Quite a busy water hole here. Such a wonderful time of the day, and I hope you're all enjoying the sunset and 
No, that for us is such special moments to enjoy ourselves um, spending time chatting with guests so we're really looking forward to having you all back enjoying moments like this with lovely sunsets because we're going to let you enjoy the sunset a little bit longer and hope until it drops while we're doing that Stewie's going to give us um, some of the answers on to <laughs> test your tracking skills and uh, we'll put you to the test so Stu will give you your answers some of um, you guys did really well some of us some of you um, <laughs> kept us entertained mm, so so yeah that was quite interesting some of you I think we're just uh, throwing people uh, curveballs there to throw them off the the scent but uh, it proved popular once again so thanks for joining in and uh, participating that was good um, might have been a bit challenging for some of you I chose three ungulates so all, they were all cloven uh, hoofed animals um, so the first one, um, and I gave you a few clues there, it was actually a, a kudu track. Uh, there's a couple of ways you can differentiate uh, kudu from some of the other antelopes. And uh, if you look back on the video, you might see that uh, the widest part of that track where I put the little stick across there is actually maybe two thirds of the way along the track rather than at the back which most other um, cloven uh, hoofed animals have the widest part of the track right at the very back of the track. Uh, so the first one was a kudu. They also register, which is, means that they put their uh, hoof into the front hoof. So they double register like this and uh, you could have seen also a little bit of a line of one of those tracks just uh, adjacent there. So they step into each other's, uh, into each footstep is like that. So. Uh, Kudu was the first one. Middle one, perhaps uh, a few of you got that correct. That was quite a, a good one because uh, the size kind of gives it away. The cloven hoof again, well, there's only one animal that has a footprint this size. Uh, that's a hoofed animal and that's the giraffe. So well done to you, some of you that got that one correct. Um, it wasn't a honey badger, <coughs> but I think that was just a, a little bit of yeah, a red herring there. And then uh, the third and final one, there was a sequence of tracks where an actual uh, buffalo had actually crossed the road and uh, probably one of those buffalo in that herd that ended up down at the river. So the buffalo track there, um, a bit of a shortened track, uh, but similar sort of width to a giraffe, but a, a little bit shorter. And uh, yeah, buffalo's moving down to the river. So well done to all of you. Thanks for participating. A good bit of fun there. Uh, perhaps we'll keep it up. Uh, maybe we'll throw in some other kinds of uh, signs and tracks and what have you. Um, I don't know, he's particularly fond of fresh elephant dung, so maybe, maybe we'll throw in some more scat and dung next time round. Told you how important it is to know your drop. There we go. Thanks once again, everybody, for joining us. Uh, it's been a lovely afternoon here, and, and it's just a, such a pleasure being out here and uh, um, sharing the moments with you. So stay tuned, same time, same place next week. Remember, it's uh, that half an hour earlier, 3 o'clock your time, 4 o'clock our time. We'll see you then. Enjoy uh, the week ahead. Bye everybody, all the very best, have a blessed week, enjoy the last little bit of the sunset.